This is an excellent group that can grind you out offensively, that can force you to go the distance defensively. They're extremely opportunistic and they're remarkably well coached. They are an elite team that will be a difficult team to beat in the college football playoff. Hello and welcome in. It's always college football. We appreciate you being here. I'm Greg McElroy. Thanks so much for being here. Mark Kubiak's here. Jack Foster's here. Jake Garcia's here. We appreciate all of you coming to us from where is you coming to us from. We appreciate all of the different people that have reached out in the last couple of days, all the different reviews, all the different ratings. We appreciate you. You don't realize how much you're doing for the show. You don't realize that. You think you're hurting us, but you're not. You're helping us. I can assure you of that. We're going to hit so many different things today. We're going to go through the top 10 bowl games that we want to see. Not including the semifinals. We will get to those. I can assure you we will get to those at a later date. We're going to give you a portal update. We're going to do that. We're also going to give you a comprehensive Michigan breakdown, statistical breakdown, just some things that they do, some observations that I had watching them, some things they do really well, some things that maybe you can attack them with, what makes them different and how they tick and what got them to this point. So we're going to do a comprehensive breakdown and we'll also give you a little bit of an update on how we saw the Heisman Trophy going down. I have a vote. I'm going to tell you who I voted for. We are not allowed to talk about that before the award is given out, so we can do so now here on a Monday edition of Always College Football. Continue to ask all of you to like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out, helps the show out. doesn't matter what you rate. Any rating is good because all ratings are good ratings. Whether they're one star or five stars, they are all good, and they're all helping the show. You just don't realize it, at least at the moment. I will also say this, too. Uh, Our numbers have been going up drastically. Numbers have not dropped off whatsoever since the end of the season, and we appreciate that very much. We want you to continue to consume the content because we have awesome stuff that we want to talk about between now and the bowl games. We have six coming up this Saturday, I might add. We also have a ton of great things coming up next week, and we have a bunch of stuff coming up around the semifinal games, so keep it locked in here on Always College Football. You can follow the show at Always CFB on both Instagram and on Twitter. You can follow me on social media at Greg McElroy. Full disclosure, haven't checked social media in a week. A lot of people that are unhinged on there, so I have not decided to swim through through the sewer like Andy Dufresne at the moment. Not going to do it. Uh, so for those that have interacted with me on there, sorry if I haven't gotten back to you. Probably not going to, at least until after the season is played at the moment. Another thing too, we have Bowl Mania, always college football Bowl Mania that you can join. Uh, it's on ESPN.com. You can join and play against us. You can play against other followers, subscribers, listeners of the show. And the winner of Bowl Mania this year will get a couple of always college football whiskey glasses. So there they are. You can see Kubiak showcasing those in a beautiful way. I have some in my house. Uh, They were two of two. One got put in the dishwasher, so do not put in the dishwasher. I got to wash those by hand. Those are really, really high end. I don't think they're crystal, but basically crystal. Uh, so check those out for sure. So I don't want to waste any more time. Let's get to our Michigan preview right here on Always College Football. The Michigan Wolverines come in as the number one ranked team in college football. It's according to the College Football Playoff Committee rankings. I think they probably got it right based on how this team has performed all season long. We have at times had them at one. At times we've had them at two. And I thought there were a couple times late in the year where you might be able to justify dropping them down to three. But they come in at number one, rightfully so. It's a team that's had an excellent year, undefeated again. Really sound growth and improvement at the quarterback spot by J.J. McCarthy. We'll detail that in just a minute. I do think they've had some playmakers emerge. But the run game hasn't been quite the same way. But the defense, however, has not dropped off at all. They've been excellent on that side of the ball. We'll start with the offense, though. They are third in offensive efficiency. Which might surprise some, but I think when you really dive in, you watch the tape and you watch everything that they do, it's really not that surprising. They're very methodical. They don't have the game-breaking, take-over-the-game type of run game that they once had, but they're kind of a churn-and-burn unit, which is fine. It's just a little different than what it was. They're 14th in points per game offensively. They're averaging about 37 points a game, just under that. 36.69 is exactly where they fall. But what's funny is you think about the offensive efficiency numbers, you think about the points per game numbers, but then you look at the rushing defense and total yardage per game statistics and how they stack up. They are 69th 
in yards per game offensively. They are 75th in passing yards per game, and they are 60th in rushing yards per game. So barely in the top half in rushing yards per game totals and not in the top half of total offense yards per game. Now, part of that has to do with a few different things. One, they're really, really good with starting field position. They are number one in college football in their offense's average starting field position. Their drive start is around the 35-yard line. It's actually technically the 35.3-yard line. So we're going to round it down for simplicity, but if you want to go off of it, they start about one yard, one foot, one foot in front of the 35-yard lines, their average starting field position for the season. That is number one in college football. So maybe it makes sense that their yards per game numbers, their rushing yards per game numbers, their passing yards per game numbers aren't what you would necessarily see jump off the page. They are an elite defense, though. Elite. Every single elite statistic that you could possibly want defensively, they have it. I tried to find, all right, well, here's the Achilles heel. There really isn't one. They're excellent in all three phases of the the run game, between the tackles, outside the tackles, deep balls, intermediate, underneath. You name it, they got it. They're really good on defense, and they're really deep as well. Everything that you could possibly want, they have. Number one in opponents' points per game under nine and a half points per game allowed. Number two in opponents yards per game under 240 yards per game allowed. Number two in passing yards per game. And given the leads that they've had in some cases, the fact that they're number two in passing yards per game is pretty dang impressive. They are also sixth in rushing yards per game allowed at 87.1 rushing yards per game given up. They are awesome. Awesome. And then as far as their efficiency numbers off the charts, they're on the defensive side. They are excellent on that side of the ball. And the biggest thing, too, part of the reason why I think they're so dang successful this year, they're a really good, well-oiled machine when it comes to taking care of the football. Just seven turnovers this year offensively. Just seven. It's pretty remarkable. I know that three of those came against Bowling Green. More on that in just a second. It tells you really all you need to know. However, they forced 24 plus 17 turnover margin is second in college football. So it's no surprise that they're as dominant as they've been and dominant as they've been really the last couple of years as far as taking the ball away and preserving the ball. Their offensive identity is pretty simple. They want to establish the run between the tackles. That's where they live. And in the past, really in the last couple of years, they've been able to manufacture some big runs. That's not really who they are this year, though. Like I said, they're kind of a three yards in a cloud of dust type of outfit, which is fine, especially knowing that they want to play some ball control. They want to take the air out of the football, and they really want to lean into their defense and have some efficient numbers offensively, but not the types that's going to light up the scoreboard in any sense of the imagination. But 70% of their rushing yardage comes between the tackles. That's pretty remarkable. That's the eighth highest percentage in the sport. 26% comes outside the tackles. That's 121st in the sport. So they're a group that wants to get downhill, and it's not that surprising. They have an excellent offensive line, even in the absence of Zach Sinter, who they do miss for sure and will miss as they move forward. He was such a really important piece for them there on the interior part of the offensive line. They're still okay there. They have a lot of guys that they can rotate in, done a great job on the portal and attracting talent. So they're fortified that depth along the front. Their quarterback is probably one of the biggest differences from where they were a year ago to where they're at right now. now J.J. McCarthy, you're going to look at the numbers, and you're probably going to push back on the growth that he's displayed. And that's fair. I, I think that's totally fine because we are kind of living in a numbers world. And I think it's easy for people to kind of quantify growth based on how much your statistics have improved from one year to the next. If you look at J.J. McCarthy, though, and just watch him and look at the throws he's willing to attempt— the windows he's able to drive the ball between, the way he's anticipating throws a little bit better, his adjusted accuracy and his adjusted completion percentage when taking into account drops and other aspects. Man, he has grown by quite a bit this year. He has thrown four picks, three of which came against Bowling Green. Didn't look great as far as his decision-making against Maryland as well. Probably could have had three picks in that game as well. But I do think that he has shown tremendous growth this year he's willing to cut it loose and he's been a better player with Jim Harbaugh on the sideline and the good news for Michigan as of this moment Jim Harbaugh will be on the sideline there in the semifinal and in victory he'll be there for the national championship game as well another piece to kind of keep into account at the quarterback spot Alex Orgy the backup quarterback very athletic he's played in four games this year 
So we've seen him a little bit, and we saw him in bits and pieces at times there in the latter part of the season. He's excellent as well. So keep an eye on him as a change of pace, package guy that might keep you honest. But J.J. McCarthy's also excellent in the run game as well. As far as their backs are concerned, it's a one-two punch. Same one-two punch as it's been for a while. It's been Blake Corum, who's averaging about 4.7 yards a carry, which is not a ridiculous number, but he's got really good numbers in the red zone. He's got a nose for the end zone, leads the country in touchdowns, so it's not surprising that he's had an elite year. He's been elite for quite some time. But the breakaway speed, the breakaway game-changing speed, we haven't necessarily seen that from him this year, as much as we've seen in years past. Donovan Edwards, on the other hand, his yards per carry numbers are down considerably compared to what they were a year ago, but his contributions in the passing game have increased some as well. He's actually fourth on the team in targets, and he leads the team in yards after catch, about seven and a half yards after catch per reception. So he's really good in space, try to get him involved, and I think he is a pivotal piece for them as they move into the college football playoff. I think his numbers need to go up. He's got to manufacture a couple more big plays. And if those plays come through the air, by all means, however you can get it to him, get it to him in space because he can do an awful lot with it. But his numbers running the football are just not what they've been. At wide receiver, it's Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson. Cornelius Johnson actually leads the team in targets, which I was surprised by upon looking a little bit further. But he's third on the team with 567 touchdowns, uh, 567 yards. 567 touchdowns would be impressive. Not quite there just yet. Just one touchdown on the year, but 567 and a bunch after catch, too. They'll get him involved in package plays and just trying to feature him in whatever way they can. Roman Wilson's the go-to guy. He's got 11 touchdowns. It's seven more than anyone else on the team. He also leads the team in yardage with 662 yards, but he isn't, isn't number one in targets. I was surprised by that. I think that they probably can feature him a little bit more. And in the event in which Cornelius Johnson... And Roman Wilson are on the field. You got to kind of pick your poison. Both have game changing ability, but the big plays are going to be par paramount, I think, when they face off against teams like Texas, uh, against Washington, perhaps, and obviously against Alabama in the Rose Bowl. Those are teams that can lock you down. So big plays are going to be very, very important for Michigan because I would imagine both teams, whatever team they'll face, the team in the championship or Alabama, they're going to sell out against the run. They're going to put those corners on islands and we're going to see whether or not Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson can create some one-on-ones and create some opportunities downfield. Colson Loveland's been excellent. He's second on the team in yards after catch and he's second on the team in touchdowns too. So if they're tight end, Colson Loveland, a huge difference maker for their group as a whole. Their offensive line is a group that I thought after eight games was going to be maybe the third consecutive Joe Moore Award winner. And then you watch them in the last month of the season, they've kind of dropped off some. Uh, I think partly because of the quality that they saw down the stretch against both Penn State, against Ohio State. Uh, Maryland gave them a couple fits as well. They didn't play great in kind of the last few games of the year along the front. Now, that is a group that is really strong, a group that I will always have great faith in, but that group needs to play better than they did in the final month of the season when they get onto the biggest stage here in a couple weeks against the Crimson Tide. Defensively, the first thing that stands out when you watch them, they are so good at tackling. I don't have the numbers. I know some, uh, some places track missed tackles. Some places track tackle percentages. I, I, just, I just watch them. I, I don't have numbers to back them up. I can't tell you. Well, they've missed 31 tackles this year. There are some publications that have that information. I don't have access to it, but I don't see a lot of tackles that are missed. They don't allow a lot of yards after contact. That's the first thing that steps out. The second thing that jumps out when you really dive into their defense is just how much they're rotating folks along the defensive line. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how many guys are playing and we'll get to that in a minute when we go position by position but man they have a ton of guys and they roll them a lot so there's not a lot of drop off from the ones to the twos and even from the twos to the threes they do a great job of keeping those guys fresh and several of which have situational play uh times in the game in which they're playing they give up about 12 and a half first downs a game that's first in college football so you're gonna have to manufacture big plays against them because they're so stout and so stingy they don't give up a lot of freebies here's the problem they also don't give up a lot of big plays they've given up just 35 carries of 10 or more yards that's 10th in college football they've given up just 22 completions of 20 or more yards that's the fourth fewest in the sport 
one other thing that makes it a little more difficult, nobody hits the quarterback more often than Michigan. They hit the quarterback on 44% of the plays run against them. That's first in the country. Notre Dame and Penn State round up the top three in the Power Five. So they're really good at affecting the opposing quarterback and generating pressure, even though they don't really blitz. This is not a heavy blitz team whatsoever. They blitz just 23% of the time. That's 87th in college football. They're not a team that's like, oh, we're going to overload your protection. We're going to overload you. We're going to beat you up. We're going to get aggressive. That's not who they are. They want to keep it in front of them. They want to make sure that you go the distance, but that front four that they rush the passer with, those guys can get home and they do so quite well. Mostly zone coverage. You don't see as much man from them as you would anticipate with the cover guys they have. I anticipated seeing a little bit more man, but they're really a zone team that wants to kind of keep things in front and not give up the big plays. I referenced the defensive line. It's truly amazing how many guys they play and how well they rotate those guys. They do not have a single defensive lineman that has logged more than 382 snaps this year. Not one. Now, you're going to think, well, how, 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 how crazy is that? I'm telling you it's wild. I don't have a number for how many teams and what the average snap count is for starting defensive linemen, but the fact that there's not a single guy that has over 382 snaps is pretty remarkable. Harrell leads the way with 382. McGregor's got 338. Graham's got 336. Jenkins, 333. Derek Moore's got 325. Kenneth Grant's got 322. Uh, Josiah Stewart's got 277, Rayshon Benny has 231, and Cam Good's got 207. Okay, that is a pretty remarkable list because I just listed out nine guys that have all logged more than 200 and less than 400, so they're rolling guys quite a bit, and some of them, like I referenced, are used situationally. Jalen Harrell, he's their guy, statistically speaking, he's their most disruptive guy as far as sacks, tackles for loss, Pressures. So number 32 is a guy that you really need to be mindful of because he could take over the game. Now their best guys besides him as far as creating disruption, number five, Josiah Stewart, and number 17, Braden McGregor. Very, very disruptive there along the front. And their best run stoppers are number eight, Derek Moore, and number 78, Kenneth Grant. Those guys are really stout against the run. Plenty of run stops at or behind the line of scrimmage, and they make life very difficult for opposing offensive lines that are trying to create leverage against those big bodies along the front. I think the linebacker group is excellent all together. I do think they are somewhat like most linebackers. They are a little susceptible in the passing game, but like I said, mostly a zone coverage units, their eyes are in the backfield. It's seldom that they're put in situations as the primary defender in coverage. Junior Colson and Michael Barrett are excellent. I think Barrett is an excellent blitzer too, by the way. I reference they don't blitz often, but when they do, Michael Barrett, number 23, He's a guy that can really get home, especially when engaged with the running back in a one-on-one -on -one pass rush situation. And then number 15, Ernest Hausman, also does a great job in spelling those guys. So those three are kind of the three that you'll see for the most part at the linebacker spot. And in the back end, there's three dudes that I think are total game changers. Mike Sainer still, who's number zero, excellent blitzer, doesn't blitz a lot, two, maybe three times a game, but when he does, he's bringing pressure, and many times, he'll be unblocked when he brings that pressure. He also has a bunch of picks, and is rounded into an excellent college football player as a guy that transitioned from receiver to DB. He's really become an excellent cover guy this year. Number 12, Josh Wallace. He's allowed just 11 completions this year. Doesn't allow a lot of big plays either. He's been terrific. And then Will Johnson, the All-American, has allowed just 12 of 27 completions and attempts this year. It's pretty remarkable, too, knowing that he is the primary defender most of the time against the top receiver for the opposition. When you think about this number, okay, Will Johnson's been so good this year, his QBR allowed... QBR allowed as the primary defender. Remember, QBR is a scale from 1 to 100, 50 being the median. His QBR allowed this year is just 6.4 as the primary defender. So if you're going to take a shot, I recommend don't take that shot against number two, Will Johnson. That'll do it for the Michigan breakdown, though. This is an excellent group that can grind you out offensively, that can force you to go the distance defensively. They're extremely opportunistic, and they're remarkably well coached. They are an elite team that will be a difficult team to beat in the college football playoff. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, 
we dreamed that dream. And with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta will be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating, pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. The 10 bowl games that we are most looking forward to here in the 2023 postseason. Now, just so you know, it'd be pretty obvious if we used number one and number two as the semifinal games. We have some incredible matchups in the semifinal. We're going to break those down extensively. So we will have every single angle that those games could potentially go. We'll break them down here on Always College Football like we always do. So we've removed those from the conversation. So understand if you're getting down to two and to one, you're like, well, where the heck is the Sugar Bowl? Understand that they've been removed, okay? We know it's a great game, but we wanted to focus on some others before we break those down here in a week or so. At number 10 is the Gator Bowl. The Clemson Tigers will take on the Kentucky Wildcats. Now, what I think is fascinating about this game, Clemson has a lot of young players, first and foremost. They've started a bunch of guys on the defensive side that were freshmen. They decided after a really disappointing start to the season, like we are going to go young in a few spots, we're going to play our best guys, and we're going to grow with those guys. And if we have some growing pains, so be it. It is what it is. Mark Stoops, however, there was a moment there after they beat Louisville. It sounded like he might be going to AM. Things decided to fall apart there at the 11th hour. He's now back in charge for the Kentucky Wildcats with a massive opportunity. I think these two teams are very physical. These two teams take great pride in how they approach the game along the defensive front seven. And I'll be curious, this one, really most of the eyes for me will be on Clemson. Clemson's a great culture. We know that. That's been established. They've proven that really in the final month of the season when they started to play some really good football, including the win against Notre Dame. But this will give them great momentum with some of the young players they'll be relying upon. This, I think, could give them great momentum heading into 24, where they're likely going to be back in the mix to potentially, potentially make a move for the college football playoff. So very interested in seeing how Clemson performs and see if they can create some momentum heading in to this upcoming season. At number nine is the guaranteed rate bowl. You're probably thinking, wait, wait, what? Hang on a second. Well, Kansas and UNLV, when these two teams get together, you got to throw the records out. I mean, long storied history and tradition. Between the Rebels and the Jayhawks, I say that tongue-in-cheek, perhaps on the basketball court, but not so often here on the gridiron. I am very interested, though, that the Rebels the Rebels are going for just their third bowl game since 2000. Barry Odom did an amazing job and has generated a bunch of excitement around Las Vegas. It's amazing to me just how good of a turnaround it's been, but has it been better than the turnaround that we've seen from Lance Leipold and the Jayhawks? Probably not, given the fact that they've had to overcome a ton of of issues this year, especially with an injury to their all Big 12 preseason pick at quarterback in Jalen Daniels. He goes out. Well, doesn't matter. Insert Jason Bean. Offense doesn't skip much of a beat. They find themselves in a warm weather bowl game against a quality opponent again here in Lance Leipold's third year. So credit the Lance Leipold and what they've been able to accomplish. Start with Kansas just for a moment. They are going to be without their new offensive coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki, who decided to take the job at Penn State as the OC. They will now move to bring in Jeff Grimes as the OC. He won't call plays in this particular game, but it will be interesting to see how the former Baylor offensive coordinator, former Broyles Award finalist, how he does 
with Lance Leipold and that staff. So it'll be very interesting to see. Hey, Jalen Daniels already said he's coming back. He's not going to play in this one. I think Kansas has a lot of speed. They're going against a team in UNLV that's excellent. Now, Jaden Mayava, if you haven't really followed him this year, he's been a really interesting storyline. Now, there's buzz that he could enter the portal, all these other, other things. But at the moment right now, UNLV's quarterback, Mayava, he is a member of the Rebels and will play in the bowl game. He's a Nevada native. He threw for nearly 2,800 yards. And a touchdown of inter- interception ratio to 14-8, and eight, so pretty good. And he did some nice things on the ground as well. So a good quarterback matchup with guys that have high ceilings. One is like a seventh-year senior in Jason Bean. The other is Jaden Miyava, who might very well find his way on some preseason lists next year as an all-conference candidate if he stays put at UNLV. So that one is one that I am very intrigued by. The Citrus Bowl comes in at number eight. And what a contrast of styles you'll find in this one. You got Iowa and Tennessee. Now, you have strength versus strength. And I think you could probably call this one the Citrus Bowl, but it's really the when the opposites attract bowl. You have a great offense that puts a ton of emphasis and excitement there offensively against a great defense with Iowa. Tennessee averages about 32 points a game offensively. Iowa gives up about 13 which one will give. Now on one side, I think there've been uh, a pretty inconsistent group offensively for Tennessee. Now they they have great capability, but the offense has been kind of up and down this year. There've been some weeks where it's like, well, it's the run game. There've been some weeks where it's like, oh, it's a pass game. It's been a little up and down from time to time this year. And you were hoping that you'd get a little more consistency on that side of the ball. But with the struggles and the growing pains occasionally with Joe Milton, it was understandable that the group might have some ebbs and flows. The defense, however, has been pretty good than they've been last year. I mean, they are really improved on that side of the ball. There are a couple guys in the portal. There are a couple guys that might not be playing in this one. But either way, I think that Vols defense does not get the credit they probably deserve. And I don't think Iowa's defense gets enough credit. <laughs> Even though Phil Parker just won the Burles Award, this is an offense that has been really rough to watch. Really rough to watch. Now, this is the final time that Brian Ferentz will be calling plays for the Hawkeyes. We don't like to beat a dead horse. They struggle offensively. They're without playmakers. They're without great team speed. They're without a dominant offensive line. But they find a way to win. And if they can find a way to win against Tennessee, that would go a long way in being able to create the same old narrative that continues. Is it about style points or is it about wins and losses? Because Iowa, they have always seemed to find a way to win. Ten wins this year then they now are in a position where they could could play in a seventh game that was decided by one score or less. And right now, their, their record in one-score games, a cool 5-1. and one. <laughs> They don't win pretty, but they find a way, and that's the way it seems to always go for Kirk Ferentz and his bunch. At number seven, I'm going with the Gasparilla Bowl. UCF versus Georgia Tech. This one might as well be coined the inconsistent bowl. Now, these two programs actually played each other last year. That was the final game of the Jeff Collins era. Uh, UCF in the Big 12 did have some great moments this year. They went 6-6, six and six, which is not terrible, but 45-3 blowout win over Oklahoma State. If that's, the, that, if that's what they're capable of, if that's the high mark, it's a pretty good starting point for the first year in the Power Five. Now, if you can tell me what you anticipate these two teams looking like in this game, uh, you might be able to make some money. <laughs> I'm not sure you're going to be able to. I know this, though. Both teams have tremendous team speed. Really good team speed. Let's start with Georgia Tech. Brent Key, I think, has done a really good job to get this team to a bowl game and to look at times. I mean, it looked like there was no way this team was going bowling a few different times. Like when they lost to Bowling Green uh, and to Boston College, it was like, I, you know, I'm not so sure about this. And then you get a win against North Carolina. You get a win in shocking fashion against Miami. That helps overcome some of the disappointing performances that they had against the aforementioned teams. But this is a group that's got a win over Wake Forest, a win over West Virginia, a win over Syracuse, and here they are now in a bowl game for the first time in a bit. Haynes King has been the reason why. Uh, He is number one, or excuse me, number three, this offense, number three in the ACC in yards per game. They're sixth in passing yards per game, and they have the top rushing attack in the conference. They also scored 23 points and ran it for over 200 against Georgia in the final game of the regular season. So they can do it. And I think they're running back Jamal Haynes, a name that everybody needs to know. Singleton at wide receiver, a name that everyone needs to know. These guys can fly. Haynes King is also a big time runner. These guys have great team speed across the board. It should be really exciting. We know what UCF is. They've been like this forever. They've always had great team speed. And it'd be massive for them to cap off their first year in the Big 12 with a win. Uh, 
and to do so in USF Stadium, a rival, if you will, or a former rival, if they want to acknowledge one, that would be significant. So win for this, win for either team, frankly, for Georgia Tech or for UCF would be massive in creating some momentum and some conversation, some good positive narrative going into next season. And then at number six, the Armed Forces Bowl. James Madison against Air Force. Now, there was not a time that long ago when these two teams were very much in the running to see who might be the top group of five team in the country. Well, next thing you know, the Falcons, they experience a QB injury. And then you have the James Madison NCAA regulations. And obviously, it kind of put a big damper on what this season could have been for the Dukes. Well, their coach now, Kurt Signetti, to add insult to injury, he's now taken the job at Indiana after a tremendous job. But this defense, they're as good as anybody. This group is elite at all three levels, and it's going to be fascinating to see how they handle what has been an occasionally one-dimensional offense for Air Force. Can the Dukes slow down the option attack? We'll find out. And knowing, too, these two teams are very excited to be here. There's no doubt about it. It's the Armed Forces Bowl, so Air Force is thrilled to have this opportunity. James Madison here going to a bowl game is a massive opportunity for both programs to get a win. So that's why it comes in at number six as one of my top bowl games to watch this offseason. Lions, Tigers, and tailgates. Oh, my. The college football season is always a great time of year. Besides the jerseys, the face paint, and the foam fingers, There's the food, and nothing gets you more fired up for game day than Eckrich Smoked Sausage. They're naturally hardwood smoked and have the perfect blend of spices. From buffalo sausage dip, sausage chili mac and cheese, Eckrich Smoked Sausage is a quick way to bring flavor to all your tailgate meals. Visit Eckrich.com for easy, one-of-a-kind sausage recipes. Eckrich, you do you. Coming in at number five is the Pop-Tarts Bowl. It's NC State against Kansas State. Two teams kind of mirror each other. Uh, I think it's one of those great matchups, not a New Year's Six matchup, but two teams that are blue-collar, chip-on-the-shoulder, physical football teams that are just really fun to watch. Now, let's start with Kansas State. They're entering the game with a new offensive coordinator. Remember, Colin Klein took the offensive coordinator job at Texas A&M, so new interim OC Connor Riley. He is now going to be calling the place. He's spent five years in Manhattan as the offensive line coach, and they've created, obviously, a terrific culture along the offensive line, one of the groups that kind of led them to the Big 12 title game last year and a group that has bounced back and has a really solid season again this year. So we don't know whether or not Connor Riley is going to be the OC back uh, starting in 24, but they're in a pretty good spot to get a good indicator of whether or not he can handle that duty here in the postseason. Avery Johnson, he's the quarterback now. Now, they went back and forth with Avery Johnson and and Will Howard, and Howard decided to enter his name into the portal. Uh, understandable, though, Avery Johnson has affirmed, reaffirmed his commitment to staying there for the Kansas State Wildcats. And it will be interesting, will be very interesting to see how he handles it. Now, Johnson... He's not really a guy that's going to do a ton with his arm. He threw for just 300 yards this year and three touchdowns. But he has been electric with his legs at times. 225 yards on the ground and six touchdowns. So it's going to be interesting to see how he kind of adjusts. Can he become more of a well-rounded player? Or will he be more of an athletic guy that learns how to become a quarterback over the course of time? It's a little bit of what Brennan Armstrong's been too for NC State. Now he's going to be the guy trying to go out in style. They also have Peyton Wilson, who won the Butkus Award, and he doesn't seem like the type that would sit this one out. Haven't heard whether or not he's going to be available, so I'm going to operate under the assumption that Peyton Wilson will play in the game. So you got two stars potentially there for NC State. One at quarterback at Brennan Armstrong, who was benched and then came back into the fold after MJ Morris decided to redshirt the season. Brennan Armstrong thrust back in the lineup, and they've done a decent job, I think, around him. This is a really interesting matchup between these two teams. So it's going to be fascinating to see which team is there two teams with tremendous culture, two teams that will give tremendous effort, two teams that will be ridiculously physical. So that should be a really fun one to watch. Now we're going to get into some New Year's Six Bowl games. All right. The number four bowl game that we are most excited to see is the Cotton Bowl. It's Missouri against Ohio State. Now the Buckeyes are Missouri's highest ranked bowl opponent since 1970. Think about that. 53 years. 
since they've had an opponent of this significance. So this is a massive opportunity for Eli Drinkwitz and the Missouri Tigers. And you look at their roster, it'd be hard to envision a scenario where they're not at or near 100%. Now they are looking for their first top 10 finish in 10 years. So it's really important that Missouri can go out here and play really well. And we saw earlier this season when they played against Georgia, they proved that they can go the distance with some of the most talented teams in the sport. Now, can they do a little bit better job of handling their opportunities? They didn't do a great job with that when they played against Georgia. They had six drives in Georgia territory. They scored just two touchdowns. And their third down conversion rate that day is not what you want. So Missouri, they've been kind of on a quest to get to this point, and they now have the opportunity sitting right in front of them. Now, how will they kind of draw things up for Luther Burden and Cody Schrader? Cody Schrader's their bell cow running back, one of the best backs in the sport, just won the Burlesworth Award, but was a finalist for the Doak Walker as well. Luther Burden was not a finalist for any wide receiver awards, but he should have probably been on the short list when looking at what he could potentially accomplish there in the bowl game. They're going to get creative, try to find ways for him to create space. They've done it all year. I would imagine they'll probably do so again in the postseason. Now, Ryan Day has got to be a little bit frustrated with the fact that Kyle McCord's in the portal. Uh, Marvin Harrison at the moment, not sure as to whether or not he's going to be playing in the bowl game, but looks like it's going to be Devin Brown at quarterback. That is nice to know that you at least have a guy that went the distance with McCord in the quarterback competition to fill in and likely to be the guy here in this particular spot. But whether it's Brown, who was 12 of 22 for 197 and two touchdowns this year, uh, played in five games, or Lincoln Kineholz, who might get the start as well. He's the true freshman. Either way, they're going to have some weapons. Now, Marvin Harrison, Emeka Ibuka, Cade Stover, Will they all play? I don't know, but I would anticipate I'm going to operate at least at the moment under the assumption that those guys will go. Now, Ohio State's been one of the best as far as attracting wide receiver talent. And Brian Hartline played a huge role in that, him being the OC. It'll be interesting to see how they try to attack this Missouri group that should be at close to full strength, not anticipating a bunch of opt-outs for Missouri. Ohio State, on the other hand, still a few that I think have to make a legitimate decision going into this matchup. At number three, it's the Alamo Bowl, Oklahoma against Arizona. Now, these two teams, if we were in 24, these two teams would have a legitimate case to be made to make the college football playoff. Remember, we expand to 12 next year, so these would be the teams that might be right on the right on the fringe of punching their ticket to the postseason. Now, a lot that should be excited about with these two. Okay, for Oklahoma, they're moving to the SEC next year, and a win in San Antonio would get them to 11-2 and in Brent Venable's second year. That's a pretty remarkable turnaround when taking into account what they did last year in his first year there in Norman. Arizona, they are trying to win 10 games in a season for the first time in nearly a decade. That was in 2014. They also are moving. Next year, they're heading to the Big 12. So it's going to be really interesting to see how things unfold in this one. Now, Dylan Gabriel, he's heading to Oregon. Uh, went for over 4,000 yards, 42 touchdowns, 12 starts. I mean, a lot to like with Dylan Gabriel, but it's no longer his show. It means Jackson Arnold. The era for him has officially begun. <laughs> now, a limited action at times this year, but he completed 75% of his passes, had 200 plus yards, had a couple touchdowns, added 78 on the ground. So it's now Jackson Arnold who will be paying close attention to. He's a five-star guy coming out of high school. This will be the first time that he is the undisputed starting quarterback for the Sooners. So we're going to be paying close attention to what he can do in the offense that is no longer going to be led by Jeff Levy, but we all know what that offense is going to look like with new offensive coordinator, Seth Luttrell. Won't change a whole lot, Lebby and Latrell cut from the same cloth, have some of the same tutors. They're going to be just fine on that side of the ball. And then on the other side, I think when you look at Arizona, there's very few teams in the country that were a bigger surprise. It's a team full of players that have never been to a bowl game. And keep in mind, I mean, this is the first bowl game for Arizona since 2017. And Noah Fafita, he's a big reason why the team has been by far the best they've been in nearly a decade. I mean, he has been huge for them. He took over as a starter against Washington uh, in the final week of September, and it's been him from this point forward. And as a starter in each of the last eight games, he's thrown for 2,400 yards, 
23 touchdowns against just five interceptions, completing nearly 74% of his passes. Their offense is 22nd nationally this year, averaging 34 points per game, but should have plenty of opportunities against an Oklahoma defense that will be missing some of their key contributors. So this is usually in the Alamo Bowl. You take Big 12 against Pac-12. It's usually a high-scoring affair. But both defenses, I think, are actually pretty dang good. I think Arizona is really stout up front, and they keep everything in front of you on the back end. Oklahoma, they're going to attack you a little bit more, but still have improved their depth on that side of the ball considerably. So that game is fascinating. I can't wait to see how it unfolds. At number two, it's the Peach Bowl. Penn State against Ole Miss. Now, Penn State, James Franklin, Lane Kiffin, kind of cut from the same cloth. Really, really good, but can't seem to quite get over that hump. And for James Franklin, it's a chance to win 11 games for the second straight season. It'd be the fifth time in the last eight seasons that the Nittany Lions have won 11 games. So uh, I know that Penn State fans are frustrated. That they're not real happy about their combined record against Michigan and Ohio State, just 2-8 and eight in the last five years. But you win 11 games. As a member of the Big Ten, it's something that you should dirt, certainly celebrate, that's for sure. Ole Miss, a win for the Rebels will give them their first 11-win season in school history. No team in the state of Mississippi, by the way, including Mississippi State, has ever won 11 games. And Lane Kiffin has guided Ole Miss to 10 regular season wins in each of the last two years, or two of the last three years. They went to the Sugar Bowl two years ago. Matt Corral got hurt early, so they missed out on an opportunity to potentially win that game against Baylor. But they now have a chance sitting right in front of them and taking down a top 10 team in Penn State in the New Year's Six Bowl game would certainly cement Lane Kiffin as one of the best head coaches in America. So this is significant, significant stakes on both sides. Penn State is super talented. They got tremendous speed. They're very physical on the defensive side. They've held nine of their 12 opponents to 15 or fewer points. Meanwhile, you look at the Rebels, it's kind of about Quinshawn Judkins. He's been playing his best football down the stretch since he's gotten healthy. Jackson Dart, his ability to run, scramble. He can also be something that is impactful in this game. You think about Penn State, They are third nationally in rushing defense, giving up just 2.16 yards per carry. Now, they can do that against Quinshawn Judkins. That's pretty sporty because they weren't able to do that a couple weeks back when they were playing against Michigan. Blake Corum that day went for a buck 45. So the last time they played an offense that's this committed against the run, they did not succeed. Will they be able to against Ole Miss? That's something that we will find out. Because Ole Miss will not be predictable on offense. You know that. It is Lane Kiffin. After all, they're going to hit some big plays. They're going to try to win the turnover battle. And the winner of this game is probably going to create a lot of offseason momentum to be kind of a trendy playoff pick in 2024. Finally, at number one, it should not come as much of a surprise. It's the Orange Bowl. It's Florida State against the Georgia Bulldogs. Now, even though Georgia lost to Alabama, if you look at what Georgia has done this year, they've had to replace a lot of significant pieces, both offensively and defensively, at quarterback, at wide receiver, at other spots. They've been without guys at times. Bowers has been out. Vlad McConkey's missed quite a bit of time. They've had to deal with a lot of attrition, but this group, according to Kirby Smart, has been really resilient. Will they be resilient after the disappointment that was the SEC title game. And then speaking of disappointment, Florida State still believes at the time they should be in the college football playoff. It's hard to push back against that, but this is a group that's been led by their defense. They're third nationally with 45 sacks and has gone nine straight games without giving up more than 20 points. They've been really good on that side of the football. I think the big thing for Georgia, they cannot turn the football over because Florida State's offense has struggled since Jordan Travis was out. Georgia's defense has dealt with some key injuries at linebacker. They have dealt with some key injuries at corner, but they do have enough depth to be able to handle what might be a very one-dimensional offense in the event in which this group, without Johnny Wilson, who knows who else is going to play for Florida State, but Johnny Wilson's already opted out. If they're one-dimensional and all they can do is run the ball, then Georgia's going to be able to tee off because Georgia's one of the best teams in the country on third down, and even in the lost To Alabama, they held Crimson Tide to just 3 of 13. So they're really, really good. Now, Bulldogs are going to dare the Seminoles to beat them by throwing the football. Can Tate, Rodemaker, and company do so? Now, Georgia's more complete than Louisville. They have a lot more firepower than Louisville. So we'll get a good glimpse as to whether or not Florida State's defense will be able to up the ante a little bit against a really talented group of skill for the Georgia Bulldogs. Now, 
going to be fascinating to see how Florida State handles it because last time we saw him on that side of the ball, they held Jack Plummer, who went 0 of 13 with an interception on passes thrown more than 10 yards downfield. It's probably not going to happen against Carson Beck and the George Bulldogs, assuming Carson Beck goes. But either way, the Seminoles are going to make life very difficult, very difficult for Carson Beck because they just got after Jack Plummer and sacked him seven times. So this is a group that Jared Verse, Kalen Deloach, Braden Fisk, and others that can really get after you. Now, Patrick Payton's in the portal. Don't know whether or not he's going to go, but either way, this is going to be a matchup that will be talked about forever. In the event in which Florida State wins the game, there will be a lot of people saying they should have been in the playoff. They should be crowned with a national championship from one of the publications. In the event in which Georgia wins the game, everyone's going to say, we told you so. Georgia should have been in. Georgia should have been in. Florida State was never good enough. Georgia should have been in. So this is there's a lot on the line on both sides be given the narrative that will be created in the event in which they are victorious. So number one bowl game that I'm most excited about outside of the college football playoff is the Orange Bowl featuring Florida State and the Georgia Bulldogs. All right, I got to hit you with a whoa Nelly here. Whoa Nelly! You said that no team in the state of Mississippi has ever finished with 11 wins. We are forgetting about the fighting Larry Fedoras of the 2011 Southern Miss. The Conference USA champions won 12 games that year. So we got to give a little hat tip to Larry Fedora and Southern Miss. Good call. I should have said Power 5. I apologize. Shout out to the Golden Eagles of Southern Miss. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence. The confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. Jane Daniels was crowned as the 2023 Heisman Trophy winner this past Saturday. Congratulations to Jaden Daniels and what a tremendous season he's had. Now look at fifth-year player, Transitioned from Arizona State to LSU in 22. Beat out Garrett Nussmeyer. Had a rock solid, really good year there in 22. But man, he took it to a whole new level this year. He received 503 first place votes. 2,029 points overall to edge Washington quarterback Michael Penix, who was the runner-up with 292 first place votes and 1,701 Total points. Now, Bo Nix finished third. He had 51 first place votes and 885. And then if you look at the transfer quarterbacks, all three uh, were transfers. So pretty remarkable. Marvin Harrison finished fourth. The rest of the top 10 was released a little later on as well. It was the closest Heisman vote since 2018. That was when Kyler Murray beat out Tua Tunga Vailoa there before the 2018 semifinal game that ultimately, I mean, fast forward a little bit, they played each other in that semifinal game and both were terrific. So uh, closest in a while. And I'm not really that surprised that it was that it was close because if you look at 2021, it was understandable that year that Bryce Young, how he performed there in the SEC championship game, there was going to be a really wide gap. 22 is Caleb Williams, going to be a really wide gap. I thought 2020, and I didn't look back at the numbers prior to reading out how this whole thing went. 2020, I thought maybe that vote would be a little bit closer when Devontae Smith won it, but it clearly wasn't. And then in 2019, it was Joe Burrow by a mile. So it was pretty obvious that this was probably the most hotly contested because I do think there is a contingent of voters that have a hard time justifying that a guy is most outstanding when their team is not in the playoff hunt. But the committee got it right. I voted for Jaden Daniels. I have a vote. I think there's 870 voters. There's too many. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that become enamored with stats. There's a lot of people that become enamored with what their team has done, how many wins that person has, a lot of highlight reels. Back in the day when the Heisman was up and coming, Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it made sense to have 870 voters because all those voters were comprised for the most part of people that wrote in newspapers. And people wanted, at the time, the the Heisman Trust wanted people to write about the Heisman Trophy because at that time it was more about 
notoriety. Hey, the, the highs, it's a big deal. The highs, it's a big deal. Well, we don't need to know that the highs, it's a big deal anymore. And to have 870 voters to me feels like an archaic way of doing business. And I don't think there are 870 people that are qualified to, <laughs> to vote on behalf of who the most outstanding player is. But all that being said, they got it right this year. I have a vote. I voted for Jaden Daniels, number one. I voted for Jordan Travis, number two, at Florida State. And I voted for Michael Penix, number three. Now, a lot of people will say, well, hang on a second, hang on a second. Jaden Daniels, one, get on board with that. But no Bo Nix, no Michael Penix at two. Well, I looked at what Florida State did when Jordan Travis was lost. And the offense is not comparable to what it looked like when he was at 100%. He was the heart and soul. He was the best player on the team. And I think I think Johnny Wilson was excellent. I think Keon Coleman was excellent. I think Trey Benson was excellent. I think Jared Verse was excellent. I think Braden Fisk was excellent. I think Patrick Payton was excellent. I think Kalen Deloach was excellent. I think Tatum Bethune was excellent. Like I think Bernardo Green was excellent. Like I can probably list the entire starting 22 for the Florida State Seminoles. Every single one of those guys were really, really good players. But it was without question that Jordan Travis was the best player. And all you have to do is watch the last game and a half, last two games with uh, Tate Rodemaker as a starting quarterback and Brock Glenn as a starting quarterback in the a- ACC title game. It wasn't comparable. Jordan Travis, to me, was deserving of that number two vote. And then Michael Penix, the reason why I had Michael Penix at number three, I thought his ability to throw guys open was on another level. On another level. Now, I also think he has a remarkably good supporting cast. A remarkably good supporting cast at wide receiver. But he made those guys better. And they went up and made plays for him, for sure. But I thought he was probably, as far as executing challenging throws down the field, I thought he was on another level. Bo Nix, if I had a vote that would go to four, he probably would have been four. Um, if you had to take it a step further, there might've been a defensive guy that could find their way on, but usually I have a defensive guy on my list. There wasn't one this year. There wasn't one that just really stood out. Like you think about some of the guys that statistically speaking had elite seasons, uh, a la Xavier Watts at Notre Dame. I look at the interceptions and you know, a couple of them were great defensive plays. A couple of them right place, right time. Cause the ball was tipped up in the air. He just happened to be there. Not taking anything away from him, but did he take over the game? the way you need to, to be considered a defensive player that is in the running for the Heisman Trophy. I didn't think so. Not this year. So it was Jaden Daniels 1, Jordan Travis 2, and Michael Penix number 3 for me. I thought all things considered, it was a great year for the Heisman Trophy. And I think the committee uh, comprising of 870 people, they ultimately got it right. So congrats to Jaden Daniels. Terrific season. A star-studded season. And what's remarkable is he is now the fifth player in the last seven years to be a transfer portal player that went on to win the Heisman Trophy, which naturally transitions us into a portal conversation. Now, there's some big fish that are still in the portal right now, like Cam Ward, the quarterback from Washington State. A lot of buzz about where he might end up. He's probably the biggest fish on the board right now amongst the quarterbacks there that is still available. Dante Moore, quarterback from UCLA, five-star guy coming out of high school. He's in the portal at the moment. We will see exactly where he ends up, but there are some guys that have made some decisions. Dylan Gabriel, talked about him a little bit earlier. He is transitioning from Oklahoma to Oregon. This is stability at the position. We know what he's going to be. Not a crazy big arm guy, but with what Bo Nix just did and the efficiency that Bo Nix just did, executing the underneath. A lot of catch and run situations. Get the ball out of your hand quickly. I think it's a really good system fit for Dylan Gabriel. Kyle McCord, quarterback from Ohio State. He's in the portal. It's looking like at the moment he's going to end up at Nebraska. This is a tremendous get for Nebraska. It's a significant upgrade over what they had. But then again, you're leaving Ohio State where you just threw for 3,000 yards, the seventh quarterback for Ohio State to ever go for 3,000 yards in a debut season. And I don't know. It's wild to me that that he just decided to jump in the portal, and now it appears like he's going to have a destination there in Lincoln, Nebraska. Will Rogers, quarterback from Mississippi State, one of the all-time leading passers in the history of the SEC. It appears at the moment like he's going to Washington, which I think is an interesting fit. I thought Will Rogers would really work well in a traditional air raid style system. That is not Washington. Washington wants to push the ball down the field, wants to manufacture big plays down the field. So the system fit for me with Will Rogers at Washington is one that I'm a little bit questionable on, but it's something that we will monitor if he decides to make that decision final here in the coming days 
and weeks. Aiden Childs, quarterback from Oregon State, who played in the third series multiple times this year, was very productive in limited work and backing up DJ Uyunglele, but still getting some time. Looks like he's going to follow Jonathan Smith from Oregon State to Michigan State. That's a really good get for the Spartans. Tyler Shuck said this last week. He was at Texas Tech. He's been banged up most of his career, but when he's healthy, he is legit. He's going to be heading to Louisville, which makes sense because he does... He is somewhat similar to Jack Plummer in his skill set. I think he's a little better decision maker, but I do think the accuracy is very much there when he is healthy and available. Max Johnson, the quarterback from Texas A&M, he was one of the first pieces to move. He's heading to North Carolina. Uh, You knew North Carolina was going to go after a portal guy, just wasn't sure which guy that they were going to go after. I was surprised that they decided to jump this early on Max Johnson. Given Max Johnson's up and down performances from time to time, throws it off his back foot a lot, questionable decision making at times, not great awareness with the pressure that comes from time to time, but he does have physical skill set that a lot of coaches I think would like. And in an offense that's going to feature Amari on Hampton, an offense that's going to run the football, an offense that's going to spread you out, it might be a better fit for him as he transitions there from AM to North Carolina. Blake Shapin from Baylor is heading to Mississippi State. Jeff Levy went out and probably evaluated the, the the entire college football landscape. Felt like this was the guy that made the most sense for them, so they moved on him early. At times, he's been really good, but at times, he's been really subpar. So ups and downs have been a problem for Shapin. Hopefully, Jeff Levy can get the best out of him, and he can elevate the position there at Mississippi State. Taylor Green, quarterback from Boise State, Looks like at the moment he's going to be heading to Arkansas, which leads me to my next question. What does that mean for KJ Jefferson? At the moment, not in the portal. At the moment, hasn't decided whether he's not he's going to go pro. But Taylor Brown, going from Boise State to Arkansas, did kind of raise my antenna just a little bit to see how things might totally shake out for him. And then Brock Vandegrift, he's from Georgia quarterback. He was a five-star, all everything coming out. He is now going to Kentucky, committed last week. How will he fit into Liam Cohen's offense? That's a big question for me because they put an awful lot on the quarterback's shoulders. He's going to have to be really cerebral and really smart. And I don't know if that's a skill set at the moment that Brock Vandergriff has. So we know he can throw it. We know he can run it. We know he's a talented kid. But how will he transition into an offense that requires a lot from a cerebral standpoint there at Kentucky? So that'll be something worth monitoring, at least at the moment. A couple other positions of note, Juice Wells. Wide receiver from South Carolina was an all-SEC candidate a couple years ago. It looks like he's going to be heading to Ole Miss. Not official at the moment, but it looks like that's the most likely destination for the former all-SEC player at wide receiver. Missed most of this year with the hurt foot. So if he can get back to 100%, that's a huge coup for Lane Kiffin and his staff. Toriano Pride, a corner from Clemson. He's going to be heading to Missouri. Zeke Carell, the center from Notre Dame, sounds like he's going to be heading to NC State. It's weird to see centers hop in the portal. <laughs> he was a starting center for vast majority of the season for Notre Dame. Didn't lose his job. Did get a little banged up against Clemson, so had to come out of the game. Did not have a great game that day. Does look like he's heading to NC State, though. At least that's where it's kind of projected at the moment. And then finally, Bo Collins, a wide receiver from Clemson. Looks like he's going to be heading to Notre Dame, where he's probably going to team up with Riley Leonard, who we talked about last week, former Duke quarterback, who's going to be likely playing for the Fighting Irish, which is, uh, is Bo Collins a difference maker at wide receiver? I don't know. I think he actually fits very much what Notre Dame's been in the past. Uh, would love to see more big plays created by Bo Collins, but either way, they need help at wide receiver if you're Notre Dame, so the more the merrier, if you will. Introducing the AT&T 5G helmet, the world's first football helmet designed to level the playing field for deaf and hard of hearing players. Radio communication continues to be the primary way professional football coaches and players communicate during the game. But if the highest level of football requires athletes to hear, it presents a significant gap for athletes that cannot. This discovery created an opportunity to apply the power of AT&T's 5G technology to make sports more inclusive. AT&T is a staple of college sports, always exploring ways to use the expertise in connectivity to advance the way coaches, athletes, and fans experience the game. Our collaboration led the first ever 5G connected helmet. It sends the coach's play call from the device on the sidelines directly to a visual display lens on the helmet, meaning it does not rely on sound or hearing to communicate. So for the first time ever, these players can always get the same information from their coach 
as their hearing counterparts. The AT&T 5G helmet. AT&T connecting changes everything. Learn more at at and dot com slash 5G helmet. Helmet is not for sale. AT&T is a proud supporter of the Gallaudet Bison. All right, that'll do it for us here on a Monday edition of Always College Football. Check in a little later this week, too. We're going to have a full breakdown. On Wednesday, there is the SEC 2024 schedule release. I'm going to be part of that show. We'll be taping it after the show, so we will break down the 2024 SEC schedule. We're also going to do a team breakdown on Thursday. Hint, hint. It's Bama. (laughs) It's the SEC schedule release. We decided to do Bama on that day, so I think you can probably understand why we would connect the dots in that direction. Could do Texas. They are going to be part of the SEC schedule release, but we're not going to. We're going to resist that urge. We're going to keep it local here in 2023, so we will do a Bama breakdown on Thursday's show as well, so lock it in right here. I want to encourage all of you again to like, rate, subscribe to the show. doesn't matter what you rate the show. Every time you rate the show, it helps us. Uh, One star or five stars, we get a little Christmas bonus based on how many ratings we've had come pouring in. Shout out to all the wonderful people of Tallahassee that have really given us some great ratings uh, in the last week. It's actually helped us. You don't realize that, but you are helping us and you are doing the good work of pushing the show because remember, all reactions are good in this format. All of them. You don't know that, but it is. So we appreciate all of you for voting, all of you for helping us, all of you for reacting, all of you for responding. It's been awesome. And the amount of feedback that we've gotten in the last week, both good and bad, it's just nice to know that you guys care about college football as much as we do. For all of us here at Always College Football, also want to encourage you to join our Bowl Mania. I told you before the show, that is going to be a fun game for us. I'm not very good at Bowl Mania. I'll be the first to admit I'm terrible. So maybe I get lucky this year and maybe I win the whiskey glasses. But if I don't, I hope they go to one of you. Hopefully you guys pick really well. So we're going to do confidence points, pick them on the Bowl Mania. The winner will get some Always College Football whiskey glasses. So that'll do it for us here on a Monday edition. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcast.